Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jada Thornton, a Corporate Citizenship Manager with the Office of Charitable and Community Giving at TD Bank. I am responsible for our arts and culture relationships across our footprint. Um, it is within my community driver. And I'm thrilled to be launching the discussion around our third iteration of the Curated Spotlight Program. You know, I am actually a big fan of the job that you guys are get, get to do every day. And organizationally, TD, we are very enthusiastic to be supporters of the arts and culture and of NADA Miami. Particularly the incredible work that, like I said, you guys get to do and bring forward um, with the diverse talent that you all represent. Your mission aligns very closely with our own. You know, at, on our corporate citizenship team, a lot of initiatives surround the TD Ready Commitment, which is our platform for our philanthropic giving. The overarching purpose of the TD Ready Commitment is to drive change by helping to, do, to level the playing field for everyone. We do this because we want the people and communities we touch to feel confident about the future. We know this is a big goal, so we focus on four specific areas, looking at the planet and our environment in a way that helps communities thrive, we look to support equitable access to health care. We promote ec economic inclusion and bringing people together in a way that empowers them and gives them opportunities to fully participate in authentic and meaningful ways. The last area is what we call connected communities. And Curated Spotlight is an ideal example of how, that, how this is supposed to work. Because when people freely come to the table, and they show up confidently as they are and are able to contribute in a way that is meaningful, that feeling of inclusion and belonging runs even deeper. Now, I said a lot about TD Bank, but I'm also very honored and proud to have the opportunity to introduce our, the woman that is behind all of that we're gonna be talking about today and the eight boosts that we get to um, partner with NADA on subsidizing. Her name is Joanna, Miss, Miss Joanna Bellarado Samuels, and she is the director of Jack Shaman Gallery. Her views on, her, she views her position as an advocacy role in helping manage the careers of artists within the gallery's roster. She is also the founder of We Buy Gold, a roving gallery presenting exhibitions, commissioned projects, and public events. She was on the curatorial team of the Racial Imagery Institute and was a founding director of Fox Freedoms, the first artist-run super PAC which uses art to inspire deeper political engagement to impact policy and the American political landscape. Please join me in honoring this special lady and as I prepare to turn over the programming directly to her. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I was honored to be asked to participate in this, this um, relatively new section of NADA, and um, yeah, I'm just really honored to be here. I think that uh, th these wonderful dealers, gallerists, will go on to talk um, about their programs and about the work that they're showing here at the fair. Hi, Levines. And <laughs> so I will hand it to them, and then we'll be in conversation with each other afterwards. I'm Shayla Mitchell. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you to Joanna, to Nada, and to TD Bank. Um, I'm based in Washington, D.C., and my gallery is named Shayla Mitchell Gallery. Uh, I'm Graham Wilson, uh, Swivel Gallery, bed Brooklyn. Um, yeah, thank you to everybody. TD Bank, glad to be here with my friend Shayla. Here too. Um, hi, my name is Paige Weary, and I am the director at the Terra del Sol Gallery. Um, are we just like doing a quick intro, or are we? Yeah. 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 All right. Oh no, I will go back. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I think I'm done. When they start doing my slides, then I'll go back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you talk. Okay. Okay, um, so yeah, that's me. So this is the artist that we're showing at um, my booth. This is Sienna Smith. She is a black woman, as you can see, a beautiful black woman, super smart and intelligent. This is her at the loom. She is a textile artist. Um, and we have, I think, five works from her. This is one, um, face one. These were actually hand loomed by her. Um, and are very abstract, 
Um, there's a moment there, um, if you could go back, there's a moment on the first one where there's a little bit of green and I actually quite like that. Um, you can go to the next one. This is phase two, so this is the second out of this series of works, um, and these are all mixed media. Yes, this one is here in Miami, but is not showing at the booth. It's super beautiful, linked together. And this is um, in the booth. This is Jacquard Woven, a beautiful piece. Um, and I don't know if anyone was at the booth earlier, but these works are about black women and joy. And I really love that our booth is focused more on black joy than trauma. Um, that's kind of where I'm at in my life. I just want to focus on those moments. And I think that black people, especially black women, how we're able to cultivate joy with all that's going on is a radical act. And so that's kind of what her work signifies. Okay, listen, you can't have favorites, but I really, really love this piece. I love the palette. I love the details. Um, if you haven't seen it in person, the details um, in person don't do this picture any justice. This is twist and turns, and as you can see this figure, she just got her nails done. That's kind of how I feel when I get my nails done. My hair probably sticks straight up as well because I'm so excited. Um, <laughs> but this is a really large piece, and um, it's 179 inches long. So if you haven't seen it in person, please go take a peek at it. Um, and yeah, that's Sienna. Um, if you have any questions about her, I am around until tomorrow. And thank you very much. <laughs> um, I talk about Amy, I talk about the gallery? Okay. Um, so I'm the founder of Swivel Gallery, which is uh, quite a strange gallery in um, Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, which is not an art hub. Um, following behind this legendary woman here who was the originator of the Bed-Stuy galleries, I would say, in a way. Um, and we started in the middle of the pandemic, and it's quite a strange space. I built the place myself. It was an old storefront tabernacle, and we focus on giving emerging artists typically their first solo exhibitions, and that's generally what we do. Um, not a great business model, but um, <laughs> yes, that's generally what we do. And so um, what we do with that is, I guess my conception of that as a former artist was that I wanted to create a place where I could help these folks facilitate um, their first shows in a very sort of uh, monumentous way or at least one that felt that way so that you know it wasn't like a closet and saying like look at my work you know where you can't really see it so I try to set them up in a position where um, it feels very refined and feels like very viable for also their career to move on to also bigger galleries and these different situations. Um, and so we are presenting Amy Bravo um, solo exhibition here at NADA. She also has her two-person exhibition at the gallery right now with Albert Puguero. Uh, she's a recent Hunter MFA graduate, Cuban-American. Um, and Amy is having a really important conversation for young people, in my opinion, um, and it is one that circulates around uh, wanting to be your own person in an area where you come from a lot of family pressure and a lot of also ethnic pressure and um, sort of wanting to be an autonomous person in that way, but also carry on your family legacy and also your ethnic le legacy as well. So um, basically her work circulates around narratives that are driven from her grandparents who passed when she was quite young. And so 
all she has left from that is stories and photographs and tchotchkes and different things. So she creates these sort of mythological worlds and allegories throughout her work where it's sort of this coming of age narrative of her trying to navigate a space of being queer and being Cuban and wanting to be a Bravo, but also wanting to be autonomous in that way. So um, everything is quite imaginary in her work. Um, so this piece, Home to Roost, is uh, the door signifies basically either going back to your childhood home or your home country and the anxieties that surround that. And that's why, as you can see in the work, that one foot is going towards the door and the other is going the opposite direction. So, um, and then this particular series that she made for Nada was started when she was a Fountainhead resident here in Miami in July. So the narrative circulates all around the rooster, which is also big in Cuban heritage. And the rooster typically signifies a male or a male ego. So um, a lot of her work also takes on these kind of like uh, machismo poses and these super stoic sort of um, like reminiscent of like 1930s like macho men from advertisements and different things like that and so Amy is basically sort of in this presentation becoming like the male heir of her family I suppose you could say okay we can carry on yeah um, so I am the director at the Tiriadol Soul Gallery. Uh, our gallery is part of a larger nonprofit program um, that has actually been around for 50 years. We work with adults with disabilities and we help people get through college, we help people find jobs or volunteer in their community, and then we also have these two thriving art studios um, with 120 artists in them. Uh, the gallery that I run represents those artists, and um, this is our first time coming to NADA. We're super happy to be here. Uh, thank you for the honor, too, of being part of the spotlight. And, um, and so we, because, uh, so most of the people that come out of the program, uh, the art world hasn't necessarily heard of them. So I like to focus on solo shows most of the time in the gallery to make sure that everybody sees how epic their art voice is. Um, and we followed through with that here at NADA. We have a solo show of Joe Zaldivar. And Joe actually drove all the way across the country with his parents. He's out there. Say hi, Joe. <laughs> awesome. He just showed up just like five minutes ago. They've been driving for five days. So, <laughs> so cool. Um, so Joe uh, has a beautiful obsession with maps and buildings. Uh, he doesn't use projections. He doesn't use a ruler. It's all hand drawn. Um, Joe had never been to Miami until we got here. And um, he, once he hears that he's going to have a show in a certain place, he does a deep dive into researching their buildings and uh, their historic monuments. And he uh, also their everyday average places like a post office and a grocery store and things like that. CVS is in our booth. And, um, and so he does a deep dive into that city, does a bunch of research, and then hand draws uh, the buildings that he wants to and the maps that he wants to. Um, there's the CVS. And uh, yeah, so that's, I think that there's when he, he comes up with these maps that, um, this is a preseason game one, and even if you're not into football, there's just something about his graphics and his text and his colors that are pretty phenomenal. Um, what's the next one? There's one of the post office that he researched for this show, the Palm Beach, Florida post office. And uh, yeah, so I think that that about wraps that up. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. <clears throat> I'm really
really proud that there's such a diverse group of practices within the spotlight. And I've been asked before kind of like what it means to curate Spotlight and what is the kind of overarching theme. And I'm also very proud that I don't really think there is one. But it's interesting to hear you all talk about your artists and, and I kind of formerly didn't see as many of the connections, but it's so much about creating space and whether it's safe space and spaces of joy and black womanhood and kind of celebrating or spaces in which to articulate melding identities or quite literally depicting physical spaces, but also kind of creating them in a way that Joe hasn't been to Miami before um, in making the work. So it's, it's exciting to see all those kind of that interconnectedness of everyone's practice. And in terms of curating, I, I actually don't really think I curated the section, but it was, <laughs> I'm proud to have made the selection and to, thanks to TD Bank for supporting and, and making sure that means more than just panels or, you know, green tabs, but is actually supporting young dealers um, be here because it's so important to have a presence and get the work in front of so many people. Um, I'm also curious about you as individuals, as a dealer, gallerist, some kind, sometimes doing independent projects and what brought you to this space and I mean Paige, I think that your organization is a little bit different in terms of not just being a brick and mortar gallery, and but why the gallery, especially in a time when at least we like to talk about um, changing modalities and maybe certain more traditional ways of working are kind of collapsing or being remodeled. Um, like the importance of having a gallery and the importance of brick and mortar um, and the importance of supporting young artists. So I guess I'm curious as to how you all came to be doing what you're doing. Um, I, I think it's amazing that Terra del Sol has these two art studios where the art is being made and then um, our amazing CEO is sitting in the audience right there, but uh, she actually hired me to open up a gallery in Chinatown in Los Angeles. So our artists are represented like any other contemporary artist on a street where there's uh, eight other galleries and 15 all around Chinatown. And so we're part of the contemporary art world conversation, um, a very underrepresented group of people. And again, thank you for NADA for inviting us. There's a couple other programs here at NADA this year that um, also have programs similar to ours, Creative Growth, which is located up in Oakland. And um, their space is, there's a gallery attached onto the studio. We're a little bit different that we're 40 minutes away from the studio, so it, it's like walking into any gallery. Um, but the importance of that is obvious for us. Like, it, it's an amazing place to introduce our artists. Uh, and then also we do other fairs. I mean, the fact that we have this space, this brick and mortar space, we change it out every seven, month, or seven uh, weeks. And um, have a space to be part of the conversation in Los Angeles, this huge city, and our artists do amazing work. And it's not about whether, you know, what is their disability, what isn't their disability. It's just about the artwork, which is what we're here to do and put them into the community and give them a, a, the same chance as everybody else. And I think that the brick and mortar space is super important for that. Um, I'm from Washington, D.C., specifically from Southeast Washington, D.C which um, I always say, uh, I always think it's important to note um, that when you come from low-income communities, um, I grew up with a lot of wealth, it just wasn't financial, uh, and I grew up with a lot of culture. And um, something that I'm very proud of that I feel like most gallerists would be shy to share or ashamed of is I had no formal art training. Um, I never went to art school and you know I was wondering even to myself well how did I develop this eye well there's a multiple things going on um, first I realized my mom was um, my mother is a lighter skinned black woman and she did not allow me to play with dolls that were not black we all of the fairy tale stories were all black even down to Cinderella I saw images of myself very early on and I had a lot of self-confidence and I remember one of the books that we were reading was Tar Beach by Faith Ringgold and so you know that was my first introduction into like black collage and I also had the Smithsonian which I'm so grateful for 
Um, the Smithsonian Museums, if you don't know, are free. Always free, always accessible. Um, and so I would always, my mom would always take us. And, you know, I didn't realize my eye was being trained then. And my eye was being trained. I knew a lot about art on a surface level. I didn't know about the behind the scenes and I've always been a lover of art. Um, and so in adulthood, when I started to find out, you know, the different behind the scenes, um, you know, occupations in the art world, I was very intrigued. Um, so that was one way. Also, uh, we had an artist in our family, which a lot of black families have that one artist. I had a painter, my uncle Virtus, and he lives in upstate New York. He still paints. He still wants me to like bring his art to art fair and like share with his friends. <laughs> He's like, bring it, baby. You know, bring it, bring it to Miami with you. And I'm like, it doesn't work like that. Um, and third was the art that we had hanging up in our house. Um, I definitely did not come from a collecting family. We had black Jesus who was really cute. He had like the buff body and like the dreadlocks. Um, I don't think that's really how Jesus looked, but he was fine, so cute. We had Martin Luther King and like Malcolm X. And so these people of reverence, you know, in our community, um, people that we love. And it also showed me, it also made me understand that photography could be collected um, and that you could live with photography. So. I had art training, it just was not formal, and uh, I think my existence in the art world is important because just like Joanna or just like Linda Good Bryant, these are women who came before me and showed me what's possible, very much in hopes that my existence does the same, existence here does the same for someone else. Um, I created my space because I had pop-ups and after the pop-ups ended, I was just sad. And I said to myself, all these black spaces cannot be nomadic. It's very it was very traumatic for me to have these spaces where everyone felt so welcome to just leave. And so I was like, okay, I gotta work really hard to make you know, this gallery be a mainstay. And, um, and I did it. So that's what our space is about. It's, it's about amplifying voices in fine art and design, and we exclusively only represent artists of color. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it about me. Um, I did not become a gallerist, I suppose, cognizantly. I uh, was an artist before, and I had a uh, uh, short but fruitful career and showed at NADA several times then also. Um, but, and I was represented by a few galleries um, all over the world and Denmark, London, Milan, Paris, here, uh, New York, sorry, I'm not in New York. Um, but, and I guess through that I just, you know, I mean I, I'm from Kentucky originally and I moved to Bed-Stuy 16 years ago when I was 18 um, and likewise didn't have any formal arts background or anything but I uh, started working at Hauser & Worth doing installations when I was 18 and then uh, I was very good with my hands so that continued and, um, and I think through my experience of you know having these exhibitions all around the world and being exposed to so many things, I, it severely changed my life and I think that like, you know, I had believed in art in a big way before that, but I think that made me realize that, you know, art can change a lot of different things and especially people and um, I think it just had such a profound impact on me that at some point I um, felt like uh, that I didn't really have the infrastructure to continue seeing out my ideas so then uh, the gallery was conceived through a single thought that I had when I said well because I was still being asked to do shows at my galleries and all of these different things and it stemmed from a thought that I said well 
if I'm not going to take up space, then I can give space. And so that was sort of the original conception. And through having done 13 solo exhibitions and probably mounted over a thousand of them in my life for other galleries, I very much knew that I could provide guidance for young people to shape their solo first solo exhibitions and these different things. And, um, and that was really how it started. And uh, it, I guess my sort of thought at the beginning was that I could, um, you know, play a big role in not only changing people's lives, but also that I would find people that were better than me and that I would contribute to the overall canon of art and the continuance of art. And um, <clears throat> so we're almost two years old now. And um, yeah, I became pretty damn good at it very fast. And I realized that it was um, the culmination of really all of my skills. And so I think it's like, you know, there's always a thing when you're young that you think that you have it, you know what you want to do or this and that and now I'm 35 so I think I finally only know what I want to do, you know, at this point. So, um, and yeah, to be able to sort of have this sort of canon that catapults people into a life they want is a huge responsibility but also it's awesome at the same time and you know I think that I don't know there's a lot of tough days being a gallerist but making shit happen for people like it's definitely lets you continue you know in a very easy way wakes you up very early in the morning and um, so that's pretty much how we started and um, now we have two spaces in less than two years and uh, we have sort of founded a handful of artists that you will definitely know of in the future for sure, so, or you probably already know of, so. Thank you. And I could just talk about bed -Stuy all day too, but I will yeah, try yeah, not yeah, to do that. So I think that part of what our jobs are in terms of the support of young artists um, and the protection of young artists and showing and being platforms, we also have this kind of double job of educating and teaching people to be, become to collectors. Um, I know we have some future collectors in the audience and I feel like I get questions really often about like what makes a good collector and, and what we're kind of looking for in terms of how we place the, the work of the artists that we represent. Um, and I mean, it, it's so different at various points of an artist's career, the kind of approaches that we take to that. Um, but I guess I'm, I'm kind of curious or to hear your thoughts about your own audience that you have and the kind of very, I'm sure there are multiple audiences in terms of where you are physically, where, you're, where your building is. Um, or you know the outreach to kind of the more maybe aspirational homes for your artists to be placed in, um, and the kind of that balancing act that you have to play as as gallerist. Um, yeah, I kind of want to hear more about what you're looking for in terms of homes for your artist work. Uh, yeah, you're so right about the educational component, especially for me. I feel like. Um, oftentimes I just take the time to even educate collectors on how the art ecosystem works. I think that's super important to not rush the process even for sales. Let people know like what it is that they're doing and so I find myself doing that a lot and it works. Um, I want the artwork from my gallery to go to collectors who understand that supporting emerging artists is when they need the most support. It's when they, in the very beginning is when they need the most support. And I feel like sometimes with the art market, they get more support later on when they don't need it the most. And so 
a lot of times I um, think people wait for the market to validate an artist when you as a collector can and you can use your resources to push artists forward and so that's the kind of collector that I would like to have. I want them to live with the work and be happy with it and kind of share it you know, with their friends. I want them to understand it. I don't want them to only look at artwork as a commodity, um, you know, but as something that they can grow with. Uh, and I just want them to be generally excited the way I am, you know? I've walked through some of these booths and I'm just like, literally screaming on the inside, you know, when I step through, and I'm excited without even knowing the background of the work. And I think that excitement and that discovery is kind of what makes NADA a great fair, one of my favorite fairs. Um, you know, every year there's an artist here that we, you just don't know, and I would hope my collectors would want to be on the discovery end of things and just understanding their, their position and how they can help. Um, okay, good question. Well, I think that... Well, can I interject for you, too? Because you've worked in all these other spaces that are so different from the space that you're running now, I think that to speak specifically maybe to that or to help guide your answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, my existence is quite strange in that way because uh, bed is a historically predominantly black neighborhood that sort of now has somewhat gentrified but it still is a sort of it's kind of the epitome of also black home ownership in New York as well um, and there is sort of just the biggest mixed bag of people in bed that you can imagine so I think being an art dealer is, and being there also is such a f funny thing uh, I call it kind of Sesame Street because I have my recurring characters that pop up every day who deeply love the gallery. Like, and it's a strange thing because you think that the art world is such kind of this microcosm of things, but I have people come in from off the street that <clears throat> know nothing about art or art history and they really get the work right away. Like they, and they usually also have the most thoughtful things to say about the work. And, I always call it the pep talk for the artist because we're, when we're installing, everybody from the neighborhood comes by and is like, comes in and they're like, whoa, this is crazy, yo, this is crazy, you know? And the artist is always like, feels reassured because regular people also us get their work. Um, so, and then the other sort of spectrum of that is then I have billionaires on my cell phone that are calling me for the work and it's kind of a very strange sort of thing uh, to live in the middle of I guess and um, but as far as like collectors and you know what I want for things is that I noticed when I opened the gallery or knew that art had become more popular than ever and so I said well, if art's become more popular than ever, then what comes with that is also more collectors, right? It's not just Instagram posts or whatever. At some point, somebody becomes involved enough that they start buying art. So then I sort of had a very big mission and like my goal was to engage new people and not sort of just chase around a small group of already existent collectors and um, with my logistics background and all of these different things and I have been able to sort of make that process quite easy on folks and quite tangible for folks and so my collector base is very vast um, and I have some of the top 50 collectors in America in my on my phone as well as just regular people who are buying with their paycheck or buying on a payment plan or whatever you want to say so I think that that is also a beautiful thing because they feel like you know they're in involved in something that is like serious you know and just as being a person that is in a 
high stature or whatever you want to say and I think that that's like you know and then it's exciting for them and I always say you know kind of like it's like when you buy art it's kind of like the it's kind of like a horse race you know I mean I'm from Kentucky so this is the best analogy that I have but you know you you go you've got your thing your list of all the things it's got all the information on there you say wow I like this this makes me feel good da -da -da, this, this all of these different things Oh, I like the name I like this da -da -da. and then you know you place your bet and you watch them go and you get to follow along with people as they go all over and continuously rise and stuff and so you in that way are then part of that like sort of you know um, you're in some way small way like part of their career and part of their life and like it's an exciting thing to be a part of you know and you kind of are like a cheerleader like rooting for them all the time and I, I guess that's what I look for and for collectors you know is for that sort of situation so um, so being part of the nonprofit world is an interesting place to be as far as selling and pricing and all that side of things and getting collectors. Um, I love where we are because it's a super approachable place. We get up and say hi to everybody that walks in the door. And um, I would say that our collector base usually starts out with the artist and then we get the dealers coming in and then now we're starting to get bigger and bigger collectors coming in. Um, it's more word of mouth. You know, the art is epic and it speaks for itself. And um, because our price point is a little bit lower than the commercial galleries, um, and we are able to do that, which I love because it's not just about making sales. I used to own a commercial gallery. It wasn't perfectly right for me. I had a space that also focused on self-taught um, art. I did that for five years and the more expensive and the more uh, popular the artists got, it, it, I started feeling like, I don't know if this is really my crew. You know, like people are stealing my artists and doing this and doing that, and it just got a little bit funky. And so I feel really good about where I'm at and the approach that the nonprofit people take. And um, and our artists, like I've just been at Tierra del Sol for three and a half years. They had a different approach before they hired me and it was more a community-based group show kind of situation where I'm like, that guy deserves a solo show. Let's pull him out, let's see what happens. Let's spend some money on frames. You know, let's get them into NADA. Let's like see what happens. And, um, and it is happening and it's cool and it's a slow, long ride and um, and I really appreciate the fact that Tierra del Sol uh, supports that and applies for grants. You know, we're able to do a little bit different things than commercial galleries are to back that up. And um, as far as where I want it to go, it'll it'll you know as high as it goes. It's it's a super exciting ride, and I love giving people their first show, which is almost all that I've done for the last four years working at Tierra. Um, and it's exciting for them, for the artists. It's also super exciting for their families to walk in for the very first time and see their children's artwork up on the wall and framed and treated like that. And even though a lot of times uh, the people that we work with, their families and the artists, they'll think that 650 or $800 is a lot of money and possibly they can't afford that. And then they'll sit there at the opening and watch people buying that, and other artists, and um, and other dealers, and and it's just the best feeling. It really is the best feeling. So, uh, I love a sale, just like any other art dealer. <laughs> but I also really appreciate uh, that starting point. And and really for our space, I'm I, I think of our space because I've got 120 artists, and not all of them are going to get solo shows in the space, but. Um, I want to cover as much people as you know are ready for it, and um, and so I uh, we also do we also do other things that are pretty unconventional. You know, like we'll do group shows at at, uh, at City Hall. 
you know, for people that aren't ready for a solo show, then we've got that. And it isn't about the sales when you're in City Hall. It's about reaching people and educating people about our program and, and about uh, the awesome work that happens there. So it's, um, it's a fun place to be. You know, and I'm, al I'm always looking for the next step for our artists too. So I kind of consider the space that I'm running to almost be a launching pad. And then I'm out looking for other spaces. Who's the next gallery that can take on this artist and help me take them to the next level? And let's all work together and get them out there because the, the art is awesome, you know, and, and it's, like I said, it speaks for itself. So yeah, that's, you know, selling and, and pricing and all that is the funky part. It can get a little funky. But it's also challenging and fun, you know, so. Feels good when it's done. Yes. Cool. Yes, it I don't know, now that we have people here, should we open to questions? Sure. Should we do that? Yeah. Question, oh, come on. Questions, all right. Don't be shy. Come on. Truly. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. No, okay. Yeah, I'll answer for you. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think that it's going in a place where it's becoming very much part of popular culture, just as anything else, you know, just as big as sports is, as movies are, as music is, and especially in America, you know, and I think that obviously that will be very fruitful for art all around and for artists and gallerists and all of the above, but. I don't really see how it can go backwards from where it is now, you know? I mean, it, when I, even when I, at the time when I was an artist, which was only 2013, there was no... Instagram had really just become popular. There was no... nowhere near the way... It's probably exponentially grown in popularity art by 2,000% since I was an artist in 2013 and I just I probably see no end to that really in a big way and especially with the youth you know when I grew up art was very unpopular it was if you wanted to be an artist or something it was like you were kind of ridiculed and you it was like not cool at all and now it's for young people it's become very like cool you know and like like, yeah, like teenagers are going to museums all the time and like um yeah it's perplexing but it's also like it's also awesome you know so i really think that it can only go become as big as it was i suppose whatever you want to say the renaissance or paris and then turn of the century or whatever you want to say like I think right now we are probably in a very historical moment in art and you don't really know what history is when you're living in it. You only know it in hindsight, right? So uh, that's what I would say, you know. See that here now, you know, you're, you're seeing Dominican artists talking about their life at home and, you know, did we ever know what it was like Dominican life, you know, so I think that's going to be very exciting. I think that's going to continue to expand and um, I'm excited. I'm excited about what I've been seeing. It looks like people are embracing more different mediums outside of painting and I love painting like the next person, but I love that people are loving textiles and loving sculpture. I want to see people collecting video. And I think millennials are slowly inheriting the art world. I think they made up 30% of art sales last year. That's huge. It's really huge. And I think we're gonna collect differently because a lot of our friends are dealers, you know? This is my peer. We're good friends. We show at a lot of the same fairs together. A lot of our, our friends are artists and we understand what buying an artwork does. It pays the rent sometimes. It helps to get people out of minds and I think we'll be collecting a lot differently. Um, 
But like uh, Graham said, uh, definitely more collaboration, definitely more mainstream. I'm just excited about different voices getting a chance to be seen and heard and like appreciated. Absolutely, I agree. I, I feel like the fact that Terra Del Sol is here, a 50 year old nonprofit working for people with disabilities, here I am sitting up here talking, that's awesome. Joe's here, drove across country, he's got a solo booth, almost sold out. That's all new, you know? And, um, and I think that the, the diversity is happening, you know? I feel like it's definitely happening and the museums are paying attention to that. They're collecting work that they weren't collecting 10 years ago. When I walk through, um, you know, MoMA now and I walk in and there's like Betty Saar and like, you know, all these people that, that I never used to see out in the, in the space, all these outsider artists and stuff out in the space and, um, and it's sweet. You know, it's really nice what's happening. I feel really good about it too. I think it's headed in a good direction. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't think that the artists at Tear Del Sol are so much following trends. They're making their work. They're doing their, their thing. And then, um, gosh, I don't know what, what, maybe you guys have an answer to that. I mean, I could jump in too. I, just, I think that, um, you know, the function of what an artist does is more to uh, be the leader in which a trend then maybe follows. But you know, the best artists are not thinking about, they're making work for themselves, or they're making work for history, or they're making work to contribute to a conversation, um, to express an idea, to widen the framework of a conversation. Um, I think, sure, there are plenty of artists, um, aspiring artists who may feel the need to pay attention to what other people are doing and kind of follow certain paths that perhaps creates trends. Um, but I think that the best artists are really kind of with blinders on, thinking about their own ideas. And things catch on. I think that there are always things in the zeitgeist, materials, for example. Or, um, and then it's also gallerists and collectors in museums who frame the conversations that can tend to sometimes feel as though they're a trend because we all borrow language off of each other. And you know, um, the lazier we are, the more that that happens. And, you know, but I think that for the artists themselves, or one would kind of hope is that they, through their expression, they're presenting ideas that people then attach themselves to and, and want to see more of, and sometimes it happens naturally, but I think that they try to avoid trends, I would say. I think authenticity for our artists, even with emerging collectors who might not know a lot about art history, uh, I was just showing in Barcelona and I was showing an Iranian artist and people were crying at the booth because she created that work with all of her heart and soul. And I feel like people can feel that, even if they can't name that. And I don't think it's trendy. I think that's uh, just what is resonating right now with people. You know, are you creating art as self-expression or are you just creating it because you think it's the cool thing to do? And I think people can tell, people can tell. Uh, they, they said better stuff than I did, probably, but I'll give a brief answer that just... Uh, well, that's part of being a dealer is that you have to grow your sort of situation because art is subjective, so there's not really... You could call a trend a trend, but only also X percentage of people are going to be on that one and then X percentage of people will like another thing and another thing and another thing. So like part of your role as a dealer is to, if you want to have a very diverse and sort of, you know, um, contemporary program is that you have to find people for all sides, you know? And so that's, you know, like when you go to a museum, that's why the I guess the work is so vastly different because uh, 
they've achieved that or sort of situation or you don't, you don't, they weren't on a trend or else, I guess if we walked into a museum, it would be <laughs> the same thing, you know, in a way. So I think that, yeah, I mean, while there are trends and there are things that are hot at a moment or whatever in a bigger sort of situation of history, it's very diverse in that way with art, you know, so. Anybody else? No. Yeah. I think it's good, yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you thank so you much, so Joanna. Much for everything. Thank you. Yeah. Now, special thanks to all the galleries that that presented and I really appreciate it and having lived in DC and that's where I like left and turned to art and my old block on Nostra and I really appreciate what you're doing there and of course the being from California and parents involved with creative growth and really appreciate the work that you do too and I can't wait to see what your artists do and what you do with your programs and I'm we honored appreciate to know you, you more thank and you. all that you've done thank really you. honestly yes thank you